Hi, my name's Reese. welcome to my channel and welcome to my Atari 2600 mod video. As you can probably tell from the thumbnail and from the video title, this one comes with quite an interesting backstory. Totally understandable if you're not interested in the story part, so what I will do is put a link up on the screen now, and you can click on that and it will take you straight to the step-by-step -step guide. So I got into computers and electronics at a fairly early age, uh, always enjoyed tinkering with things, designing circuits and upgrading and modifying computers and that kind of thing. A while back I decided to set up an Instagram account so I could share this passion with the world, as well as my ever-expanding game, computer and console collection. One of my kind of big interests and, and ongoing missions, if you like, is to buy up these old computers and games consoles and try and get a decent video and sound output from them. Usually composite video at the bare minimum, obviously S-Video or RGB. I don't claim to have invented or pioneered anything particularly amazing on that front, just a tinkerer, but uh, one system that I particularly got into was the Nintendo Famicom. I uh, took some existing designs for composite modifications and kind of refined them and came up with my own twist on it. There is a detailed step-by-step -step guide on my website and I will be making a video at some point in the near future. And I had a nice little sideline importing them from Japan, modifying them and selling them on eBay. So after a while of this and getting some happy customers under my belt, I get a message on Instagram from someone with a blue tick, a verified account, you know, a celebrity, so to speak. And it's a name that I instantly recognise, and that name is Jason Bradbury. If you're not from the UK, you'd be forgiven perhaps for, for not knowing this name. He's a tech journalist. He's best known as presenter of Channel 5's The Gadget Show. He's a huge nerd. Uh, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying that. Definitely a man after my own heart and very much into his uh, sort of his gadgets and his retro gaming. And he says, yeah, I'd like to buy one of your Famicoms. So I send it over to him. And as you can probably see from the subsequent Instagram posts, he's very happy with it indeed. Had a lot of use out of it and uh, a lot of fun with it. And then he contacts me again and he says, hey Reese, your Famicom was great. Now I'm interested in an Atari 2600. Is that the kind of thing that you can do? Now, I hadn't really considered modifying the 2600 and offering them for sale. They're fairly common, unlike the Famicom, but I had done one personally for myself, as well as a few other Atari consoles. I started off with Atari. At 10 years old, I had an ST, so very, very big fan. So I said, yeah, you know, why not? I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. He stressed that he wanted it quite quickly uh, for a new sort of social media campaign that he was starting with his, uh, his 8-bit consoles and things. So the 2600 arrived, I installed the mod, managed to get it turned around, managed to get it sent out to him. As you can see, he's obviously had a lot of fun with the 2600 as well and had a lot of enjoyment out of that too, which of course is fantastic. He's, you know, I'm really proud that uh, he now owns two of my consoles and uh, they're featured quite heavily on his Instagram. Inspired by Jason, I think, uh, and by his sort of social media escapades, I thought, why not put a YouTube video together myself? I, I filmed the process of installing the mod in the 2600. I always wanted to kind of do some instructional videos, and this seemed like a great place to start. So I think without further ado, we'll get on with the modification. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the comments. I'll try to stay on top of them, and uh, hopefully this could be the start of something big. You never know. Enjoy! So here it is, the Atari 2600. Uh, as you can see, it uh, still has its original RF cable attached, so we'll remove that. Uh, so if we just flip this thing over, and there are six screws on the bottom that we need to remove to separate the two halves of the case. So the screws are number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, and number six. And there are two screws here which we're going to be leaving in place for now. So now the uh, two halves of the case just ease apart gently and here we have it, the insides of the 2600. So as you can see there's uh, quite a thick layer of dust in here which we'll need to clean out. We'll deal with that later on. But, uh, there are a few components here we need to unplug, so there's the ribbon cable and the RF cable here which plugs into the RF module and a couple of other bits too. So we'll just uh, pull out the ribbon cable like so, take out these two screws which hold the switchboard into the case. We'll remove these grommets which protect the switches and then that should just lift out easily. So the motherboard itself is actually inside this metal box here. Now this label often has the data manufacturer on but this one seems to be blank. 
to remove the motherboard box from the case, we just flip it over. And there are two screws on the bottom, which we've uh, seen before. We'll just pop those out. And here we have it. So just hold on to the black piece of plastic that protects the joystick ports. And then we have six screws here. Just remove those. And then once we've eased this bottom cover off, there are two more screws that hold the motherboard into the box. So referring to the schematic here, we can identify the TIA, or the Television Interface Adapter Chip. This chip generates the video and audio signals. So uh, we're in interested in video signals, which are these pins here. As you can see, they're separate chroma and luma. So just going back to the motherboard, the video pins are along the bottom edge of the chip here. Now these are open collectors, which means that they have pull-up resistors on them. Following the signal path along, we get to this CD4050 buffer chip onwards through this bank of resistors and then uh, the signal is combined and ends up here on pin 12 of the ribbon cable. So just to help visualise that we'll have a look at the motherboard. So our video pins are here, pull down resistors, then the uh, 4050 chip, the second bank of resistors and finally out to the ribbon cable. Now, of course, in addition to our video signal, we also need an audio signal, which we'll also be getting from the TIA chip, uh, specifically this pin. It's only mono, so just the one pin. Uh, it's also an open collector, so we have a pull-up resistor here on the output. Following the signal path along, we have a filter capacitor just here. Onwards to resistor R209, which we'll actually be removing. And the reason we're removing this resistor is because of this amplifier circuit here, which is going to be replaced by our mod. The components we need to remove are Q202, R216, L201, and R209. There are a few different ways to get this hooked up, but this is my personal preferred method, which is a 3.5mm socket. These cost uh, less than a pound on eBay. But make sure you get the TRRS, which is a tip ring ring sleeve version, and then you can use it with one of these, which is a Raspberry Pi composite video cable. As you can see, it's wired for stereo audio, which just means that we need to connect up the mono audio to both the left and the right channels. The exact wiring of these sockets can vary depending on the manufacturer, so it's always good to check them with a multimeter first. So we just switch this to continuity mode and go over each of the pins in turn and just check that we have continuity. If you're doing this for the first time, it makes sense to actually write them down as you go along, but I've worked with these particular sockets before, so it's just a case of confirming what I already know. This is the composite mod board. As you can see, I've pre-soldered a socket to this one. So on the input side, on the left-hand side here, we have four wires. Two of them are for power, and the other two are audio and video. We will be modifying this wiring slightly as we go along. Here we have the three and a half millimeter socket already connected. I've just bridged the connection between the left and the right audio. So we're going to pick up our audio from here, which is the right-hand pin of the resistor R209, which we removed earlier. On the video side of things, obviously we're keeping these components intact, so I think the best place to pick up the video signal is actually from the ribbon cable just here. So what we'll do is we'll just isolate this wire and connect that directly into our composite mod board. Of 
course you'll want to check the wiring of your specific board but in our case yellow is video and the green is for the audio. What I'm actually going to do is remove the yellow video cable and just solder our pink ribbon cable wire directly to the mod board. So we just need to snip this connector off and strip this wire. Of course I'd recommend that you actually tin this wire with some solder, but uh, in the heat of the moment it seems I forgot to do it. So don't forget that. Now we're going to route our green audio cable. So I'll just put that under the cartridge port just to keep everything nice and tidy. Just strip the end and we'll feed it through that uh, R209 contact, obviously remembering to tin the wire this time. And we'll just solder that on the back of the motherboard. Being an amplifier, our mod board also requires power, so consulting our schematic of the Atari 2600 switchboard, we can see that the RF modulator has a 5 volt power feed on pin 11 of our ribbon cable, which is this pin just here, so I think that's a sensible place to pick it up. Also we'll need ground, which we can take from any of these three pins. Personally I recommend pin 10 because it's on the end and it's quite easy to get to. So what I'm actually going to do is pick these up on the motherboard side and just keep all of the wires together for the mod board. So I'll just secure these two wires to the motherboard itself using a piece of blue tack. Pick up these two pins for our 5 volts and ground. then we'll just secure that in place with a piece of tape. As you can see the wires uh, happen to fall into the right place for our mod board, so we'll just strip those and just solder them into position. So hopefully now you can see why I picked up the power where I did. The wires are all nice and tidy and together and obviously we'll be able to route them through the top of that motherboard box with no problem at all. So we'll just give this a quick test run. Uh, obviously I've hooked up the bare minimum so we have power, we have the uh, composite video and audio uh, just hooked up to my capture device. Got uh, Space Invaders in there. So just uh, double check the connections and yes, looks like we have some video output. So that's excellent. Uh, it's looking pretty good. Just uh, start a quick game and make sure we have audio. Uh, I think we can call that one a success and start putting this thing back together. We have a few different options as to how to mount this thing in the case. Personally I'd like to put them at the back, just on the left hand side, well out of the way. Just keeps everything neat and tidy, so I think we'll put this just here. Now it uh, needs an 8mm hole, but uh, first things first we'll just mark the position, just 
so everything's central. It's quite soft plastic, so it's quite easy just to make a dent in it with a uh, small screwdriver. I don't have a step bit, so we'll just start with a smaller drill bit. Just put a uh, pilot hole in there and then work our way up to the 8mm that we need. Now it's finally time to put everything back together. So hopefully you can remember where all of the bits came from. The only slightly complicated thing here is obviously the extra board that we've installed. So we just need to make sure that we're routing the wires just so they don't get trapped anywhere. Just uh, test fit this motherboard back into the box. We have to replace the two screws at the bottom. And uh, put this back panel back on. Six screws again just to put that, uh, fix that in place. Now, of course, don't forget the plastic port protector for the joystick ports. We'll just put those bottom two screws back into position. Just hold it all together. Obviously, make sure you use the right screw for this, particularly if you're filming it for YouTube. We'll just route the wire through the uh, hole that we've drilled in the back. we need to solder this onto our mod board. Of course, remembering to thin the wires, as always. So just to prevent this board from flapping around inside the case, we'll just use a uh, double-sided sticky pad here. Just test fit everything, yep. And, uh, unfortunately, it's gone slightly out of shot here, but it's just stuck to the back of the bottom part of the case. Just make sure it's nice and uh, firmly stuck on there. Tighten up the nut on the uh, three and a half millimeter socket. Now it's just a case of replacing the two screws on the switchboard and of course uh, reconnecting that ribbon cable. Don't forget the grommets that we removed from the switches earlier and then uh, we can replace the top case. Finally it's just a case of replacing those six screws in the bottom just to hold the top part of the case on. And there we have it, one completed modified Atari 2600. So of course, before we can ship this thing out to Jason, just need to give it a quick test. As you can see, it's all looking uh, rather nice and solid with its new port installed in the back. So we'll just take our Raspberry Pi cable. Obviously this is uh, off the shelf, a fairly easy to find cable, so it's uh, absolutely ideal for this job, just in case they get lost or need to be replaced in the future. Connect some power here. Obviously of course we'll need a joystick. go with the uh, classic Space Invaders once more just for our final test.
I like to think that I take pride in my console and computer modifying work and I think a really good way to finish off these Atari 2600s is to paint the orange bezel around these switches. They always inevitably end up chipped and dented and the paint all flakes off over the years. It's relatively easy to mix up the correct colour and get the right finish on them. I will be making a video on this at some point in the future but for now if you're interested in refurbishing the orange bezel on your 2600 there is a guide on my website. I'll put a link down in the description below so you can uh, follow along with that. Finally, I just wanted to say thanks for watching my video. If you enjoyed this, um, if you found it informative, please like the video. Please feel free to subscribe to my channel. Obviously, as you can probably tell, I'm relatively new to this, so uh, it's nice to have all the subscribers I can get at this point. Thanks for watching.